Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. Welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Bugs and Butterflies. It's nice to see you all here. Uh, we just went out for a quick walk after lunch and it was kind of hard to come back inside. So thank you very much. Perhaps you're watching on your device and you're already outside, but it's certainly a beautiful day. And again, welcome for joining us. I am James Stevenson and I work with the local government, Pinellas County government. I am a government employee, but I am part of a cooperative, a cooperative between the local government and the University of Florida. So we are the extension of the University of Florida right here in Pinellas County, providing information for free uh, to the citizens of this county and surrounding counties on interesting topics, uh, that have the kind of hidden meaning, hidden message of conserving our natural resources and conserving our wild areas, our preserves, and all the creatures and plants that are found therein. I'm coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve. We are the largest bit of land in Pinellas County that hasn't been developed. Uh, no houses out here no development out here. Everything is just left to its own devices. And we're 50% upland habitat and 50% freshwater wetland habitat. So we have all the plants and animals that are associated with both of those. You know, if you think about Pinellas County, we're surrounded by beaches. And so our, our marine and coastal habitat is pretty well um, secure. Uh, there are preserves like the preserve at Whedon Island uh, that preserves our coastal habitats. And, and we're the last remaining bit of uh, the freshwater wetland and upland habitats. And here's a picture of our lovely preserve, not even all of it. We're close to 9,000 acres um, from an aeroplane flying over. You can see the sunlight reflecting off uh, this pond just there. Today's topic, bugs and butterflies for beginners. Let's start because as of this afternoon, you're all going to be junior entomologists going forward. So let's get the vocabulary right. What we're talking about are insects. Bugs and butterflies are both types of insects. Not all bugs. I mean, all bugs are insects, not all insects are bugs. So today's topic, insects. And we use the word insect because it means a thing that's cut up. Uh, it's, it's incised. It, incision means cut. Sections, all these wonderful uh, Latin derived words and insects are made of three main sections. And if you are paying attention, you can probably guess the three main sections of an insect's body. Got it? Yes, the head, the thorax and the abdomen. Do you feel like an entomologist yet? You're using these gigantic, hard to say words, head, thorax, abdomen. Very good. And if you look even cl more closely, each of these sections are subdivided. So the head has sections, the thorax, one section has one pair of legs, another section with another pair of legs. The abdomen is even made of sections. So that's why this group of animal, animals is called the cut up animals. Three main sections and each section further divided. The front of these animals and all these animals have this in common. It's what makes them insects, the head. And the head is where the the primary sensory organs are located. The photoreceptors, which is a fancy way of saying eyeballs, and the antenna. 
These are how insects pick up environmental cues or clues uh, from light using their compound eyeballs and from other sensations in their atmosphere that they pick up through their antenna. And there's a, eyeballs in insects are pretty much the same. They're just these compound structures, each lined with photoreceptive cells. We're not entirely sure what an insect perceives, but we do know that at least some can perceive three-dimensional objects. Uh, it's probably not a kaleidoscopic vision of the world, the way that um, 1950s horror movies would have us believe. But anyway, insects can see, and some can see in 3D, we know that. And they have these, um, they also have these um, extensions called antenna. The pearl, plural is antennae. When I was a kid, and to this day, I might refer to them as feelers, uh, they use these extensions of the head uh, to feel around. They can use them to tactile. They can feel, literally touch what's in front of them. Uh, some like these that are shaped like the pages of a book. They have a great surface area that they might be able to pick up chemical signals in the air. They might be looking for a mate. They might be looking for something rotting that they might like to eat. Uh, so different, here we have the long hair-like antenna of our foe, the cockroach, and they can detect whatever they need to detect through, through those types of antennas. So antenna, they can pick up humidity. Maybe an insect is starting to dry out. It can get that clue from its antenna. It can find someplace dark to hide and, and not dry out. Like I said, it can, they can pick up chemical signals, which might signal a food or a mate, um, the temperature, direction, uh, wind speed. Think about it. If you're going to fly and you're very, very small, you might need to have some way of gauging the wind speed. So the antenna, uh, extensions of insects' heads uh, that allow for all kinds of environmental clues or cues to be received and, and processed by the little insect brain. Also on the head is where feeding starts. And all insects have the same mouth parts, but they're shaped differently in different groups of insects. So the same mouth parts in a beetle, like we have up here, this beetle, the beetle's mouth parts uh, are kind of put together like masticators or grinders for chewing. A lot of beetles love to chew up dead wood uh, or get through things. Maybe they chew into fungus. So they have these modifications. Another group of insects, the butterflies, uh, they have their mouth parts configured not into grinders. They have the same mouth parts, but they're configured differently into a long siphoning tube called a proboscis. Other insects have the same mouth parts configured into a sponge. Uh, the flies that like to land on dog scat, um, they use that sponge. Same mouth parts, but they're modified into a sponge. They can lick up all that good stuff off the surface of uh, dog droppings or, you know, whatever. Um, Bugs, true bugs, a subgroup of insects known as the bugs, and mosquitoes, their mouth parts, same bits, just configured and, and shaped differently. They have piercing mouth parts. And we all know that mosquitoes are capable of piercing through hide or flesh, uh, in the case of humans, and they can, you know, slurp up whatever their food is there. So all of these insects have the same mouth parts just configured and molded and fashioned into these different feeding mechanisms. The thorax, the middle section of an insect, that's where locomotion is centered. So on the thorax are attached the how many legs? 
How many legs do insects have? Six legs. Three on one side, three on the other. That's true of insects. So common denominators of insects, three main body parts, six legs, and two pair of wings. The insects were the first animals on earth to get off the ground. Most of the animals before the insects lived in the oceans. That's pretty much all there was. And of course, the exoskeleton of the oceanic creatures developed. We have things like the crabs and the lobsters, the horseshoe crabs, all these things were already in the seas. Also with sectioned up bodies, those creatures with exoskeletons eventually made it onto land and some decided to stay. And a single ancestor made its home on land and we ended up with all the insects that we have today, complete with their exoskeleton. And over time, they developed these wonderful, uh, this wonderful system of flight which opened up, literally opened up a whole new world uh, to take over. And the insects certainly did, became very, very uh, prolific. So we have two pair of wings for a total of four. We have in insects, we have two wings in the front and two wings in the back. And those are referred to as the fore wings and the hind wings. So two fore wings, two hind wings. Um, it gets kind of confusing when you talk about there's two fore wings, fore wings in the front and hind wings in the back. And those are very obvious, of course, in this ancient group of insect, the dragonflies. Uh, even insects like moths and butterflies. It's the same body plan, head, thorax, abdomen. On the thorax, there's six legs, two forewings, and two hind wings. Now, the variety and diversity of insects is such that the wings aren't necessarily always obvious, or they're not even always present. Some insects never develop wings. It's in the genetic code, but because of their lifestyle, they never develop them. Think about the ants. The ants spend most of their time underground and wings would certainly be a hindrance, certainly not a necessity if you live underground. But at certain times of the year, it is necessary for certain ants in a colony to leave that colony and set up shop somewhere else. Other groups of insects like the beetles, they have one pair of wings modified not for flight, but for some other purpose. In the case of the beetles, the four wings, the front wings are modified to protect the very thin and membranous hind wings that the beetles actually use for flight. When the beetles aren't flying, you can see the little hinge where the hind wings can fold up and nestle uh, inside the four wings. And this beetle can then burrow underground without worrying or without the danger of tearing up those delicate flight wings. And many insects will fold their wings over their thorax and abdomen, uh, over their back, uh, to, again, to protect and to get them out of the way if and when that insect happens to land. So it kind of gets them out of the way. So that's the thorax, the hind section of an insect is where everything else. We've got our feeding and our seeing and our feeling going on in the head. Our locomotion is going on from the thorax and everything else happens in the abdomen. So the abdomen is where insects breathe, it's where they digest and where they reproduce. So those are the functions of the abdomen and this photograph of a grasshopper shows the abdomen further sectioned and each one of the sections has a little hole right in the side and that is how insects breathe. Again, 
common denominator again across all these various groups of insects. This is how insects breathe, not through their mouth, not in and out, they don't have lungs. They have these little holes in the side of their abdomen and through moving through musculature, opening and closing or, or inflating and deflating the abdomen like a bellows, creating negative and positive pressure by the motion of these muscles. That's how they can draw air in from the environment and then expel it through these little tiny holes. Each hole is connected to a what's called a tracheal system. You might be aware of your own trachea or windpipe. Uh, it's also called a tracheal system in insects. It's how air circulates through the body tissues, through the cells, because animal cells, as we know, need oxygen. It's why we breathe. It's just this group of animals does it differently. They have something other than lungs to facilitate that gaseous exchange. Also in the abdomen, so here you have the spiracles along the abdomen, and there's also, of course, some throughout uh, the body as well. Uh, also the digestion begins at the head where feeding takes place, passes through the stomach and is digested and sent out into uh, the interior of that exoskeleton um, through the, uh, the mechanism of these things called the Malpighian tubules, uh, basically creating this lovely insect soup of nutrient that's digested and made available to all the cells of the body. And finally, in the abdomen is where reproduction takes place. And female insects have quite a lot of their abdomen uh, given over to the production of eggs because insects, one of the reasons they're so successful is their ability to produce hundreds and hundreds of offspring in their lifetime. So strength in numbers, very um, easy, very difficult to overwhelm uh, millions and millions of offspring. So if one offspring from one female insect survives, the whole population survives. If a hundred of her offspring survive, even better. Insects, as we know, we've all been, we've all been to kindergarten and, and beyond. We know that uh, the butterfly goes through this wonderful process called metamorphosis, a change in form, literally translated, a change in form from an egg to a caterpillar, to a chrysalis and then magically into the winged adult. Um, lar egg, larva, adult. Uh, that's a complete metamorphosis. That's a 100% change. Uh, if you were studying insects, you might be hard pressed uh, to know that this was actually going to be a grown up monarch if you, if you had never seen this uh, magic transformation before. Complete metamorphosis. That's a very advanced way of growing up. Early on, when the insects had first dragged themselves up out of the water, many had to return to water to lay their eggs because they still hearkened back to those times when they were aquatic. And such is the case with the dragonfly. Uh, they also don't have that magic transformation from an egg to a crazy looking larva to a, a chrysalis to an adult. Dragonflies and many other of the early diverging or the early evolving insects pretty much look like the adult when they're small. And they grow up and they shed their exoskeleton and grow a little bit more and shed the exoskeleton and grow a little bit more. And finally, at their last shed, the last time they lose their exoskeleton, what emerges is the adult form with the wings. Um, let's take a look at some of these groups of insects from the very, very earliest to the very most advanced or the most highly evolved. Let's take a look at the bigger group of insects. And what we hope for you today is to get uh, a better understanding of the diversity of insects that are around us, the ease 
of observing, observing the, this gr interesting group of animals take away, hopefully, if there's any yuck factor or fear factor. Uh, hopefully, one of the messages is that you have nothing to be afraid of 99.999% of the time, uh, and uh, where they come from. So in order to understand where insects come from, we have to take a look at their phylogeny. That's the $10 word for the day, the phylogeny. How are these groups of insects related to each other and where did they come from? And for that, we need to look at a simple branching, what's referred to as a clade or a clan. Um, this represents from the left to the right, a timeline. And all these words here, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, sounding familiar? These are eras of time. These are periods of time, epochs and ages, all that sort of thing. So down here on the left, that's the longest time ago. And the Devonian was around 400 million years ago. That's a big long time, 400 million years. And that's around the time that we were talking about those aquatic crustacean thingies, arthropods, exoskeleton jobs, were pulling themselves onto land and getting accustomed to life on land and eventually becoming at home on land. And subsequently, the air, the dawn of the very first insect. So that's way back here, way back in the Devonian. See how that works? We're gonna draw a line from Devonian down to the first insect. And what we see here is there was a creature and that creature remained unchanged in all this time through the Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, all the way up into today. And that group of insects are called the mayflies. They're almost unchanged in their body form from when insects first appeared on the scene. Another group which diverged and diversified from that first group of insects also remained, it evolved a little bit further along, but it also remained pretty much unchanged. And we have a group called the dragonflies. So the mayflies and the dragonflies, today's species, which might not have existed. The species probably didn't exist, but the body form and the group that it belongs to, they have remained unchanged through all those years. The species might be modern, but they have all the same characteristics of those early diverging. Uh, the mayflies and dragonflies have those characteristics of the very first. Uh, another organism diverged into this group that actually have a common ancestor here, but today they're represented by groups called the stoneflies, the earwigs, the grasshoppers, and the roaches. So they've been around for a while. They have a common ancestor, but they branched off much later than, and they have, they're more highly evolved, if you will, or more highly specialized. Moving on up the phylogeny, we get more and more, quote unquote, modernized, uh, more and more specialized. And we have the origin of that complete metamorphosis. Uh, so these down at the bottom, uh, their eggs hatch, they look just like the adults, only small and without wings. And by the time you get as highly evolved as the butterflies and moths, you end up with that complete and crazy metamorphosis. So that's the phylogeny. And what we're going to do next is we're going to go from the bottom to the top and take a look at some of the larger groups of insects. Starting down towards the bottom with the dragonflies. And the dragonflies together, uh, thousands of species all over all the world. Uh, the odonata is how dragonflies are, uh, care, are identified. Uh, they are called the toothy ones. 
the odonates, and that's because they are active hunters. Look at the size of those eyeballs. They take up most of the head. They even meet right there in the middle. So can dragonfly, dragonflies have very good sight and they need that sight because using these uh, kind of, they seem to be, uh, um, what do you call it when it doesn't move? Anyway, fixed, they have almost fixed wings, but they beat so fast you can't even see uh, and very, very highly maneuverable. Fast, forward, backward, fast, they can laterally move, they can soar and dive and they attack their prey and grab them with their teeth and consume. So the early dragonflies were certainly hunting those early mayflies and making a quite a good living at that. And as other groups of insects evolved and also had these wings, the dragonflies were right there to snack them up. But being towards the bottom of the insect phylogeny, they are still dependent on the water for their reproduction. Their offspring have to grow up in the water. So dragonflies lay their eggs in or just above water. The eggs hatch and the nymphs or the young dragonflies, they spend up to several years underwater, freshwater, uh, hunting just like they will do as adults, but they have to hunt what's avail available to them underwater. Look what baby dragonflies can do. Um, their mouth shoots forward like an arm with teeth on it and grabs whatever it wants to eat and then pulls it back to the true mouth uh, where it is chewed up, digested, and sent through to the Malpighian tubules that we remember before. Eventually, this nymph is going to go through its final molt, crawl up out of the water, and emerge as the adult with those seemingly fixed wings, feeding on flying insects uh, and starting the cycle over again. Moving a little bit up in the phylogeny, we have a group of insects which we don't get to encounter very often, but it oftentimes, well, if you see an earwig, uh, you might be a little bit alarmed. They have this very large pincher at the end of their abdomen, and that is a defensive mechanism, um, perhaps against dragonflies. The earwigs are kind of ground-based. They're referred to as the dermapterans, which means the skin winged, uh, because they are primarily subterranean. They like to live in the detritus. They like to live in fallen leaves. They found, excuse me, they found their niche uh, in all the plant debris that was raining down from all the land plants. And so they can scurry around underneath the plant debris and so their wings were a little bit in the way and they just kind of reduced to nothing more than these little pads right here. But I like this slide because it shows something unusual for modern insects. Uh, these towards the bottom of the phylogeny, uh, you can see the eggs, you can see the little hatchling, the little larva. It is pretty much just a ghost or a shadow of its parent here. And the, uh, the earwigs, um, they are one of few insects that actually care for their offspring. So this mother earwig has laid a clutch of eggs and is looking after them, bringing them food, protecting them against any harm with her scary pincher thing here, moving them out of the way of trouble, and so on. So that's, again, the, the, the modern earwigs have these characteristics and have been unchanged uh, for quite a many million of years. Moving up along the phylogeny, we encounter the group that includes the crickets, the grasshoppers, and the katydids. And you can see how those three organisms are related to each other, but there's hundreds of species of crickets hundreds of different kinds of grasshoppers and 
hundreds of different kinds of katydids, but they all have something in common. They have these long, powerful back legs and very straight wings, which gives, up, gives them their name, the orthopterans. Uh, the difference between a cricket, a katydid, and a grasshopper is how they have the same parts put together differently. So crickets, they have the hind legs, but they have dark coloration. They're active at night. They have very long antenna. They need to pick up more signals in the darkness than would be available through their little eyeballs in the dark. Uh, crickets are very good at singing, making a lot of noise because again, they can't use visual cues in the middle of the night. They have to rely on things like sound uh, vibrations. Grasshoppers, more active during the day, shorter, antenna, uh, more brightly colored for various reasons. Some um, insects and grasshoppers in particular, they like to advertise the fact that you better not take a bite because I'll bite you back or I'll be poisonous or I'm just pretending to be poisonous or ferocious, but I'm not really, but I want you to believe that I am. So all these different color patterns have evolved in the very different groups of plants. So the grasshoppers, the crickets, and the katydids, which are basically just a flattened version of a grasshopper that look very much like a leaf. So those are a group, again, the, the hatchlings look pretty much like the adult uh, without that complete metamorphosis that is um, characteristic of the more highly evolved of the insect uh, orders. The mantids, uh, the group of insects that are referred to as the mantids. Now, again, they have the same parts. Remember, we're, we're all insects here. We're all head, thorax, abdomen. We're all compound eyes and antenna. We're all six legs and four wings. Uh, but in the mantids, their body is oftentimes elongated. They are very good at mimicking sticks although they're different from the stick insects, but they kind of have the same shtick. They, shtick, stick, get it? They hang out in branches uh, with these grabby forearms that they hold folded up in front of them. And some early observer of nature decided that this group should be referred to as the mantoids. Uh, because they look like they're praying. They look like prophets. They look like they're holy to somebody. Um, and that's what gives them their name. The fact that they hold their forearms in this position, it ain't because they're praying. They're trying to catch some prey. And they use the barbs on their forearms um, as deadly daggers that they can sweep in front of them, grab their prey, bring it back, and devour it. There's a Bark mantis um, that we have here in Florida. Um, the other one was called a grass mantid. This is a bark mantid. Uh, very brightly colored, um, would be very difficult to hide, would be very difficult to you know, avoid A, being eaten, or B, being seen by, pot by potential prey until you see this insect in its natural habitat or try and see this insect in its natural habitat. See if you can spot the mantis while I get a drink of water. You got it? Very good. We have on this tree bark, two eyeballs, two antenna, a thorax with two visible wings and two folded up wings and there's a leg and another leg. So very well camouflaged this bark mantis. And the mantids are very closely related to another group of insects which we'll just kind of briefly touch on, shall we? Because they are the roaches. And this is our native, one of our native roaches, the palmetto bug. They're not a bug. They're an insect. 
they're a roach. Blattodia blatta, B-L-A-T-T-A, is what the Romans called roaches. They've been with us as long as we've been settled down because certain species, not all, not all species, certainly not the palmetto bug, certain species have taken up habitation with us humans because we're messy and they are adapted to living in our mess. They're pre-adapted to living in our mess. We're good at making messes that feed them. We're good at making uh, piles of stuff that they can use for their reproduction. The palmetto bug though is not one of those species. This, the palmetto bug is not a pest species. These things want to be outside. They don't like air conditioning. They don't like heating. They don't like to dry out that much. They'd much rather be outdoors in the leaf litter. If they accidentally wander into your house, they're going to use their antenna to try and find their way out. So give them a hand because they can't fly. You can see where the palmetto bug's wings would be. But again, because they spend most of their life crawling around in the undergrowth, they have lost the need to fly. They can get all their work done without wings and wings would be just kind of an encumbrance. They'd be in the way, uh, traipsing around in the leaf litter. The pest species, on the other hand, they can do all those things. They can fly, which makes me scream. Um, I love all the insects. I love to let them crawl on me, but a roach, I don't know. I got a cave person in my brainstem that sees one of these, and especially when they fly, it's just an insect. It's a head, thorax, abdomen. It's two forewings and two hind wings. It's antenna, no big deal, no harm but something visceral happens when one of the pest species enters into my life. These have been moved around by people outside of their native habitats. And as I mentioned before, they're pre-adapted to living in human mess. And so that is what, that is, that is what has made them pest species. Another native roach is the green banana cockroach. And these are arguably quite pretty. If you can get over the roachy, roachy roach roach factor of them, they are emerald, their, ings are, their wings are diaphanous green, uh, very lovely. Uh, they do live in these larger colonies um, where they raise their young, again, kind of kind of a throwback to the earlier, earliest branching members of the, of the group of insects. Um, you can see before they go through the final molts, they're actually dark brown, cryptically colored. They're probably underneath uh, some bark, or something like that. So most cockroaches exist as individuals, but some have this colonial capability uh, colonialization is taken to another degree in the next group of insects, which are the termites. Uh, the isopterans, which means they have the same shaped um, wing, uh, same, same sized wings. And if you look closely, you can see a termite on this blade of grass with its wings very diaphanous. There's a few in the background there. Let's see if I can get this to move for you. You can see at certain times of the year, these colonial insects uh, that live inside of rotting wood, they need to leave. They need to get out. They need to go and start new colonies of their own. So a particular cast is produced that doesn't eat its way through wood. Instead, these larvae are brought towards the surface where they go through their uh, last molt and emerge with these wings that they use to fly off and um, start a new colony. And that colonialization has led to um, a difference in the sizes and jobs of different members 
of the colony. And oops, current slide. And here we have uh, one of the cast that spends most of its time chewing. And you can see another one of the cast with its wings. One had flitted away earlier. And I thought I saw a little itty bitty one. So there Please, are your, just- your, your screen's not sharing. Oh. It just stopped. <laughs> okay. Share screen. Screen share. There we are. Okay, we're back and I was trying to show the video of the termite with no wings. Here goes one of the cast with the wings and a smaller little member of the same colony. So different sizes, different jobs, all working together. So as we move up through the progression from the least specialized to the most specialized, we begin to see um, these insect species working together um, as, as more of a team than as, an, than as individuals. Here's why we don't call insects bugs, formally. Now, you know, you're talking to your friends, oh, what's that bug? And you are referencing a fly or a roach or something like that. But if when you're, once you've educated your friends about the proper use of these words, you can refer to the true bugs, a type of insect. They're referred to as the hemipterans, which means half wing, uh, because they only have two flight wings. They're F-O-R-E, their front wings, again, like the beetles, are modified into uh, a more protective covering of the two hind wings that they use for flight. The true bugs have this kind of diamond body shape, that's pretty typical of the true bugs. Um, they're very good at synthesizing chemicals from their food into secondary um, compounds that they use for their defense. Ever heard of a stink bug? That's a true bug that has a true ability to make some true stink. It's a defense. Anything that ever bites down on a stink bug will never bite down on another stink bug as long as they live. Um, other characteristics of the hemipterans or the true bugs is that their mouth parts are modified into a dagger uh, that they keep folded up underneath their face. Uh, and they have this kind of narrow, most many have this kind of narrow elongate head uh, where the dagger folds up underneath. And when it's time to feed, uh, it uses that dagger, swings it out and uses it to pierce through the exoskeleton of its prey, other insects, um, and slurps out all that good product of the Malpighian tubules. Remember all the good juice that circulates throughout a bug's insides, inside that um, exoskeleton. Some true bugs, some hemipterans, use their dagger to pierce plant tissues and slurp up plant tissues. So some true bugs are pests of plants um, and some are just out there eating other insects, eating plants, not causing any problem at all, just being this a member of this particular group of insects, the true bugs. Another member of the true bugs with a diamond shaped body, these crazy eyes um, and um, two wings, two, two main flight wings, two lesser hind wings are the cicadas. And these are the insects that make all the racket in the trees in the summer, the, among the loudest animals on earth they have a special tympanum. It's like the head of a drum that they can rattle back and forth. Uh, it's more like um, if you take a can, a metal can with the lid taken off 
And if you press on the end, you can make a little, you know, that little wacka wacka sound out of the metal. It can do that a million times a second. And that's how it makes that really loud sound. It has a similar structure uh, on its thorax that it can rattle. Uh, cicadas, you can see here the, the life cycle, the stages from a pretty much small version of the giant thing. Uh, so not a complete metamorphosis, not a drastic change, just after each molting getting slightly bigger and slightly bigger, again, until the subadult form can crawl up out of the underground using these hook-like forelegs, uh, go through that final molt and emerge with the wings that it uses to fly. Now, where's that dagger mouth that I was promising all the hemipterans have? Well, in this group of hemipterans, the mouth doesn't even develop. It only feeds as a larva. It can, uh, de depending on the species, cicadas can spend up to 17 years underground eating tree roots or pieces of tree roots until they get big enough to emerge as adults. And then they're full. They've been spent 17 years eating, done eating. The adults, all they do is fly and reproduce and then die. So that's the cicada. That's the sad cicada life story. Now we're getting a little bit further evolved, further developed, and the social structure has become very well entrenched in many different groups of the hymenoptera, the membrane-winged insects. So all of these are related to each other. They have these membranous wings, and of course, they include the stinging insects. These are ones that, especially those that live in colonies, will defend that colony. And they have special repurposed reproductive structures that they can use to defend their colonies. The hymenopterans, the membrane wings, but the hymenopterans come from humble beginnings. They come from the very first of the hymenopterans. Uh, their larva, still around today, look very much like caterpillars, but they're not butterflies, right? We're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're in the hymenoptera. We're in the butt. We're in the uh, the hymenoptera are the, you know, bees and wasps, that group. But the sawflies are hymenopterans whose larvae still eat plants. And these are sawfly larvae right here at Brooker on a sand pine tree. So they look very much like caterpillars. They act like caterpillars, but they belong to a special group of wasps called the sawflies. Other members of this group are called mud daubers. And these are a type of wasp, another type of wasp, uh, that live solitary lives. Uh, she, this female, uh, has, they're also called the thread-waisted wasps, uh, can carry one mouthful at a time of mud, eventually creating these adobe apartments, one mouthful at a time, working alone, creating these adobe apartments. Uh, each one of these holes represents a cell inside this tube. So this tube that she made has a perforation here, not, not perforation, septum, um, little wall in between the two cells there, a wall in between these two cells here, and a floor of this cell here. And this wasp uh, has an organ called an ovipositor or ovipositor, however you wanna say it. It means egg layer or egg positioner or egg putter downer. 
the ovipositor. So it is this long slender thing that it uses to lay an egg over there very carefully. Has a second use that ovipositor has also developed the ability to act like a hypodermic needle where it can e inject venom into its prey. And in the case of the mud daubers, it's spiders and or caterpillars. Very nutrient dense, very thin skinned, both of those things, the spiders and the grasshoppers. So the mud dauber can use her ovipositor also as a hypodermic where she injects venom into her prey, not her prey, I should say, her baby's prey, stings them, paralyzes them, doesn't kill them, carries them back to her adobe apartments and stuffs each cell with paralyzed caterpillars and or spiders, not dead, just paralyzed, and then puts an egg in there and seals it shut and does that again and again and again and again and again. So when the eggs hatch, she's long gone. She's, she's down here now while these guys are growing up. When the eggs hatch, they discover all these wonderful paralyzed caterpillars and get to work eaten and gorge and yum and go through all the uh, stages and molts until they are fully grown and they can chew their way out of their protective adobe apartment and fly off as an adult and set up another um, wasp condo. So those are the mud daubers, solitary. Now we've got a group of social wasps, truly social wasps with true um, castes and divisions of labor. There's a queen and where's my pointer? There's a queen wasp and she kind of watches everything happening. And she laid the first egg. She made the first paper tube and laid an egg and fed it after it hatched with caterpillars that she caught herself or some wasps are actually nectivorous. They'll actually visit flowers and pollinate flowers and come back with nectar and, and feed their offspring. And so she had many, many, and each one of these represents one of her offspring hatching, but she stuck around this time. And so did her offspring. And her offspring are all daughters and they all help her feed, maintain, and raise even more daughters so that the colony can get bigger and bigger and bigger. But with all these vulnerable eggs and larvae, these hymenopterans have used their hypodermic ovipositors with venom defensively. And they will come and get you if you mess with the nest. So that's how some insects have gotten this um, reputation. Now, away from the colony, they're not aggressive because they're not defending anything. They're, they're more defensive when they're far away, collecting food, foraging, and what have you. But once you get, start getting close to the, to the young, defense kicks in. And you can end up with problems if you um, offend a colonial insect in their colony. The European honeybees, very well established here now. We see them wild. There are wild colonies of uh, European, otherwise non-native honeybees uh, evolved to store plant nectar in the form of honey over winter when no, no food, no other food is available. Of course, food is available year round in Florida, um, but they still go through the motions. Uh, the European honeybee, a truly social hymenopteran. They do also have that ovipositor that's been modified to a defensive strategy. And even the worker bees, the non-reproductive bees, 
retain that defensive modified ovipositor, even though they're never going to deposit an ovi because they're workers, not queens, uh, but they still have that stinger, that modified ovipositor um, to use to defend the larger colony. And bumblebees are native among some of our many native bees, the bumblebees, they're kind of in between. Uh, small colonies, manageable colonies, a queen and a dozen or so of her daughters, raising a few young, maybe two, three dozen a year, nothing too extreme, um, not too defensive. They generally just like to li <clears throat> live and let live. <clears throat> Excellent pollinators, very well adapted to our native flora. So they fly when we have plenty of flowers and they rest or go dormant when we don't have too many. Uh, so that's just another group. They do have the activated ovipositor too. They're just not quite as defensive. Also in this group of bees and wasps are the ants. And the ants, of course, primarily, almost exclusively, construct underground colonies. So a very colonial system, very caste driven from the queen to the workers, some of the workers having certain jobs other different from other jobs. They're often referred to as super organisms where a colony of ant is basically one thing and the queen is the brain and the reproductive system and the workers are all the cells that work together like tissues, that work together like organs and so on. But anyway, different casts of ants. And my favorite group of ants, native, are the harvester ants. And just like their name implies, they harvest. They harvest grass seeds. They feed on grass seeds. They're not attack ants. They're not crazy meat eating marauding ants. They just traipse out into the woods and they collect seeds and they bring them back and they keep a very tidy colony. Uh, you can't really see what's going on there. Their colony stretches about a meter and a half underground with side chambers all in the darkness, all underground, each chamber given over to a different purpose. Uh, some might be where they store their grass seeds. Some might be where they have eggs laid, some maybe where the young are growing up, ones where the queen is sitting there producing millions of eggs during her lifetime. And one cast of the harvester ants, their job is to grind the seed into flour. And so they got these gigantic heads full of muscle that they use to work these mandibles like crushing, grinding you know, mills, they can mill that grain into flour to feed the developing young. So they look like guards. They're called guards, but they're not really guarding anything. They're just waiting for their chance to grind up some flour because that's their, that's their thing. So the harvester ants are harmless. They're not too defensive, but if anything, bothers them enough. You can pick these things up. They don't bother you. They don't like to be picked up. Just don't squeeze them. If they're offended enough, harvester ants have the most toxic venom of any insect their size. And I have knelt down on one and it hurts. But it was, I didn't do it on purpose. And the ant was only defending itself and we both survived. It hurt like the dickens, but we both survived. Another <clears throat> group of ants, the cone ants, they're the ones much smaller, but again, with those underground burrows, precluding the need for wings. And we don't imagine ants as being winged because they spend all their life underground or scurrying around harvesting uh, they don't really need wings underground. But just like the termites, eventually a new colony needs to be established and a brood is produced by the queen that are going to grow up with 
wings and they're going to leave the colony and establish a new colony somewhere else. The wings come off because they only have the one, the one use to get them from this colony far, far away to start a new colony. So their wings are kind of temporary. And that is how ants get from one place to another. They can recolonize and they come up in the millions, these winged ants. Imported red fire ants, another non-native hymenopteran. Uh, they've all got hypodermic ovipositors, repurposed ovipositors that do not posit ovies. Um, they're simply there to defend the colony and they are extremely aggressive defenders of the colony. These were imported from South America. They came in on um, plants. They came in on uh, plants that might have been grown in the nursery, in their uh, in the in the potting soil in the pot, and then the potting soil in the pot were all imported to this country, and the ants got loose, and now they're established, and they're a big problem. Um, we all know that the red ants are a big problem because they are so aggressive, and the University of Florida Extension part of the research that Extension does is research into um, solutions for problems like invasive species and solutions for problems like the imported red fire ant. And scientists at UF have tested many different control techniques, eradication techniques for getting rid of imported red fire ants, which we encourage you to do but use the methods that are recommended by the university. It turns out that simply putting a tablespoon of cornmeal on a fire ant colony does absolutely nothing. And it turns out that pouring a kettle of boiling water onto a colony of red ants and waiting 15 minutes does absolutely nothing. And it turns out through studies that pouring gasoline on a colony of imported red fire ants and then lighting a match is an excellent way to go to the hospital. Use a product that is designed, created, and implemented for the eradication of this invasive species. If you're an ant, you want to avoid these. These are the ant lions. They live in the bottom of these pits and at the bottom of this pit, waiting for an unsuspecting ant to wander in and fall into the bottom of the pit is this. This is the ant lion, modified, mouth parts that can grab and pull the ant underground, where the larvae ingests, digests, grows, pupates, and emerges as this adult. Uh, this group of insects, kind of an obscure group of insects, uh, they're very cryptic, spending a lot of their time underground, and the rest of their time, their reproductive phase, nocturnally. So this is a group that you might not normally encounter. Uh, the adults look a lot like dragonflies, only with their wings folded over their back. If you ever want to get tired of studying insects, try the beetles. There are, at least that we know of, 280,000 different species of beetle and counting. And if you take all the species of wild animals, all of them, everything else, all the birds, all the species of whales, all the species of reptiles, all the species of every other animal, you still won't get to 280,000. There are more beetles than all other animals combined. And they're just one subgroup of insects. They're called the coleopterans which means protected wing. And early on, we saw the slide of the beetle taking off and it had these uh, elytra, the two modified fore wings, front wings uh, that protect those membranous flight wings. 
this is the uh, eyed, eyed click beetle. These are not eyes. This beetle has eyes because it's an insect. It's got eyes and antenna and a mouth and so on. But on the thorax here, it has these fake spots. It's camouflage, it's mimicry, it's, it's um, foolery, uh, it's trickery, trying to make you think that it's a much larger animal than it really is with these gigantic go away eyes. Another spokes beetle, the lady beetle, or the ladybug, the ladybird, properly the lady beetle, right? Because it's a beetle, not a bug. We met the bugs. This is not a bug. This is a beetle with the elytra, the protective outer wings, and the flight wings, um, characteristic of the beetles. There's also the unsung hero of many deserts and grasslands, the dung beetle. They can take dung, roll it into a nice ball, move it across the landscape and bury it um, with a dung beetle egg inside. So this beetle is basically taking animal manure, spreading it out over an entire landscape and burying it. So the plants definitely benefit from that distribution of otherwise wasted nutrients uh, so the beetle wins by getting free manure. The grassland habitat benefits by having this beetle doing the work of putting the manure underground. Uh, and the beetle gets the manure to reproduce. Next group of insects are the flies. Now they're called dipterin. D-I is the prefix, which means two. And these insects, they have F-O-U-R, they have four wings, but only two develop into flight wings. So that's what gives them their name, the dipterans, the two wings. Love bugs are a type of fly because they're put together like a fly. They have the two forewings, missing hind wings, several other characteristics that give uh, love bugs um, admission into the fly order. Uh, the females and the males almost always joined as soon as the female emerges from underground from her uh, from her pupa, from her metamorphosis uh, into the winged adult. She gets mated and the male uses his excellent eyesight to fly around. Females, not the best eyesight. Their job is primarily the production of eggs and so the female is going to be much much larger to accommodate that gigantic ovary to lay the thousands of eggs that that pair is going to produce in their brief light lifetime the single most dangerous animal on earth the most deadly forget your sharks forget your snakes forget your poisonous this or attack that or electric this or whatever, the mosquito hands down kills thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people every year. Humans fall victim to mosquitoes more than any other animal ever because mosquitoes carry disease. And mosquitoes also have the ghastly modified mouth parts why they can't just be a chewing beetle, wouldn't it be a better place? They're not. They have their mouth parts modified into a six bladed Swiss army knife. And using chemical cues that it picks up through its antenna, it finds something with blood in it, like us, uses the antenna to find something with blood in it, lands and then uses this mouth part, these mouth parts uh, to cut through the flesh to the source of blood that the female uses to feed and develop the eggs that will be the next generations of mosquitoes. Now the female mosquito herself and her husband, if you will, the male mosquito, they don't really eat the blood. 
they're oftentimes nectar eaters as adults. What they feed themselves on is nectar. They're pollinators for heaven's sake. Mosquitoes are pollinators for heaven's sake, but they need the blood. She only needs the blood to grow her eggs. Crane flies, I've got this one stuck in um, as a representative of those two developed flight wings in the flies. And the hind wings are modified into these structures uh, that are more for balance and agility. They're called haltairs. Um, and they allow them. The crane flies are another one of those adult insects that don't really feed. They don't really eat anything. I know they have a reputation for eating mosquitoes because they look like giant, I don't know if it's because they look like giant mosquitoes or just the rumor got loose somewhere, but they generally don't eat anything. Uh, they just reproduce as adults and they do their feeding um, as immatures. Now I thought we already talked about the bees. We're back, these are flies. These are bee mimics. These are flies that want you to think they're bees. Why do you think a fly would want you to think they're a bee? Because they don't have venomous ovipositor. They cannot sting, um, but they want you to think they can, so you'll not put one in your mouth. Uh, so we have these bee mimics, also very good pollinators because they're so fuzzy. Uh, if they do happen upon nectar feeding on a flower, looking like a bee feeding on a flower. Uh, they're protected by looking like a bee and they also facilitate pollination. We have this giant horse fly. We call it Darth Vader. You can't spray anything to stop this from eat from biting you. It finds its blood meal with its eyeballs. So you can't spray this one away um, unless you're invisible. And we haven't figured that out yet. Uh, so basically you have to outrun the horse flies. But thankfully, they're only seasonal. We get them for maybe three weeks in the spring, maybe three weeks in the autumn. And they're relatively easy to run away from. But they're a fly. Again, a blood feeding fly. Now we've worked our way up towards the very top of insect phylogeny to the very most highly evolved, most specialized, uh, most highly metamorphosized, but we haven't said anything about the moths yet. Well, they're in the same group as the butterflies, the lepidopterans, the scale wings, and moths also have that uh, crazy metamorphosis life cycle. They're just kind of the anti-butterfly. They're active at night. Uh, they have little fat bodies. Um, they have feathery antenna because they pick up signals using more chemical than visual because they're active at night. Now, not all moths are active at night, but generally speaking, they have those body modifications. Um, the Luna moth being one of our largest and showiest of moths. And it has these fake eyeballs like we met earlier on as a defensive mechanism in the click beetle. By making fake eyeballs, you can maybe fake out something that wants to come and bite you into thinking it's something much, thinking you're something much larger with bigger eyes. The imperial moth, a very large active at night moth. And during the day, it's camouflaged in rotting leaves. So even though we might see this against a, a pale backdrop and think, good grief, that's a very showy, shiny, brightly colored moth, but it would be almost invisible amongst leaves that are turning from red to yellow to brown. The eel moth, another large moth that spins a silken cocoon. Uh, this one, if you bother it when it's asleep during the day, it swings forward, its forewings revealing the eye spots, fake eyes, not real eyes, um, on its hind wings as a way of saying, I'm an owl and you need to leave. The caterpillar of the EO moth, like many moths, are covered, talk about venom, uh, covered in these hypodermic, I keep saying hypodermic, but it's true. They have these um, 
needles, hollow needles that actually can shoot out and inject the venom if you brush up against them and you won't do it again. Very, very toxic, these caterpillars. Butterfly larva, moth larva are referred to as caterpillars. Caterpillars are primarily, but not exclusively, uh, leaf eaters, vegetation eaters. And they have very soft bodies. They have very nutrient dense bodies. They make really awesome food. If you're a bird and you have to feed your little precious babies something with a lot of nutrition, that's not gonna hurt them, you shove a soft caterpillar down their throat and then go and get 20, 30, 50, 100 more until your baby's ready to fly off. So the caterpillars have had to try and catch up with the fact that they're such a wonderful source of protein um, by defending themselves. And one of the ways that some of the caterpillars have done that is by the production of these stinging hairs. We'll meet that when we attack or address the butterflies. How many of y'all have stuck around for butterflies? Excellent. Thanks for putting up with me. I've gone on a little bit long, but we'll just go through, just like we've been through the major groups of insects, now we'll go through the major groups of butterflies because we've got tons of different butterflies, but they, just like the insects writ large, also fit into nice little compartments uh, that share characteristics that put them in that um, compartment. The sulfur butterflies are a group of butterfly that are oftentimes pale yellow and they're called the sulfur butterflies because the element sulfur, the mineral sulfur is pale yellow. They love the legumes and in particular, this one genus of legume called the sickle pod, native sickle pod. And the caterpillars, they're kind of cryptically colored, even though this one is bright yellow and black, uh, the senna flowers are yellow. And if the caterpillar feeds on the yellow flowers exclusively, it's gonna turn yellow. So when it's eating, it just looks like more yellow. If the caterpillar is going to feed exclusively on the leaves, it's going to be green. It's going to take on the, the pigmentation of the leaves that it's eating, and it's going to be hidden while it eats. The zebra longwing, our state butterfly. I'm so glad we have a state insect. The zebra longwing larva, it looks like it's covered in those stinging hypodermic needles, but it isn't. These are also fakery. This is also trickery. Uh, there's no stinging anything here, but it looks like it. And if a predator has ever tried to eat something that stings, very likely not to bother this caterpillar either. So this caterpillar is feeding on the same larval host plant as the gulf fritillary, which might be familiar to you. We have a few bright orange butterflies. This gulf fritillary is showing that, that uh, siphoning mouth part, that proboscis. The mouth parts, the mandibles and the maxilla and everything that's modified to do a different job in mosquitoes, modified to do a different job in the beetles. In the case of the butterflies, it's this proboscis that can reach down into these tubular flowers and drink up the nectar. What butterflies can't do is pollinate. Look at this thing tiptoeing around on the top of these flowers. How is it going to pick up any pollen? There's nothing for, to pick it up. Butterflies are meticulously clean. They clean off the dirty pollen. They clean off the dirty everything. They wipe the mites off. They're there. Um, Butterflies are pretty bad. I'm not saying there are no butterflies that pollinate. Of course, there are some that can, but really it's the bumblebees and the native bees that do the majority of the pollinating. 
The butterflies have figured out a way to outsmart the flowers by making this long proboscis that can get to the nectar without getting messy, without getting messed up. Some butterflies, in fact, the zebra longwing, our state butterfly, they steal pollen from flowers and eat it. It gives them superpowers. It allows them to live most of the summer because it's so uh, protein dense. Uh, but anyway, the Gulf fritillary faking out these flowers, not doing anything, stealing nectar, and yet we love the butterflies. Passion vine, zebra longwing and Gulf fritillary, their larval plant, passion vine. And here we have another fakery. We have the larva looking like it's covered in spines and it isn't. Another of the larger butterflies, the white peacock, uh, named peacock because it has these eye spots. We've met eye spots before, haven't we? They're a way of hopefully offending something into thinking that you're a larger critter than you really are. Uh, these are very, very lovely kind of ivory white. They, they come in waves. This isn't a, a species that you're going to see in great numbers year round. They tend to all mate at the same time. So all their larva hatch and feed and emerge as, as adults at the same time. So they can all have that, that party and make another generation of white peacocks. Their larval food plant is uh, fog fruit or frog fruit or matchstick plant. Uh, this is a native verbena relative, and you can you might on close up here. These are very small flowers, but you might on close up be able to see that familial resemblance uh, to that popular potted plant. Um, this is a plant that would move into your lawn um, unless you sprayed all the weeds. This would be a, a, a yard or a lawn pest, a lawn weed. Uh, we like to encourage people to have the most diverse lawn as possible. Grass doesn't contribute too much as far as ecological services, but a very diverse, many different species of small plants that make up your front yard. Uh, the diversity is going to bring in a huge diversity of insects, which lead to other insects, which lead to birds, which lead, and so on and so on and so on. You can create habitat in your own front yard with the simplest act of having simply more than just grass in your lawn. Everybody knows what this one is. Everybody knows what this one is, right? Yeah, it's the world-renowned Viceroy. This is Viceroy. Viceroy is a butterfly that feeds on willow. Willow has an acid in its leaf, salicylic acid. It's what humans have turned into uh, salicylic acid capsules that we take for a headache. It's called aspirin. But salicylic acid is actually quite toxic. And that salicylic acid built up in the larva and in the adult of the Viceroy makes them both pretty unpalatable. So anything that attacks a viceroy is gonna wish it hadn't, and it's never gonna eat another viceroy or even try. This is the monarch, uh, different from the viceroy in that it does not have that stripe through the hind wing. And the monarch and the queen, monarch, Queen, Viceroy, they all mimic each other. Even though the Viceroy, the Queen, and the, and the Monarch, they're not related, they all manage to look alike because they all have this, this toxicity. So the Queen and the Monarch, they eat the milkweed, they become the poisonous. Uh, if a bird or any other predator bit down on a Queen, they would certainly not bite ever again, bite down on another queen, but they're probably gonna protect the monarch and the viceroy as well. And, you know, 
if anything bites a viceroy, it's going to leave the queen. So this is a type of mimicry where multiple species protect each other by looking alike. So it's a special kind of mimicry. We'll finish up with the swallowtails. They're named after this bird, uh, the swallow, which at least one species has these elongated tail feathers, giving it its swallow tail. But in the butterflies, it's the hind wings that have this kind of elongated projection uh, that really doesn't serve much of a purpose other than identification and I'm sure some sort of display. Uh, we mentioned the difference between moths and butterflies, the moths having those feathery antenna. This is a good shot of the butterflies with their club shaped antenna. Uh, the zebra swallowtail butterfly, very fast, powerful flyer. Uh, you can really often just get a glimpse of them striking in their black and white coloration. And you won't see these in Pinellas County unless you visit land that's been set aside as preserve. Their host plant is ugly and nobody wants a pawpaw, sadly. Nobody wants a native pawpaw when they chop down the woods to build their house. If they see a native pawpaw, they're gonna say, get that out of here because it's hideous. I wanna plant an azalea bush or whatever. But pawpaw is critical for the zebra swallowtail. It's a larval food plant and the only larval food plant of the zebra swallowtail. It's also a nectar source for the zebra swallowtail and several other butterflies as well. Thankfully, the tiger swallowtail is not quite so picky. Its larval food plant is trees, just trees, nothing special. You got a tree, zebra swallowtail will eat it. The larva will eat it. So we have plenty of, sorry, tiger swallowtail. We have plenty of tiger swallowtail because their larval food is trees. The gold rim swallowtail or the polydamus swallowtail doesn't have a swallowtail but it's put together like all the other swallowtails, so it gets to be called a swallowtail. I can tell this one because it has that single unbroken line of gold around the rim. So I can identify among the dark colored swallowtails, this is one that I can identify. Others, um, I need photographs. Um, some people are really good and they can name them as they fly by. Um, the gold rim, they feed on pipe vine. Uh, we don't have native pipe vine here in Pinellas County. So they switched up their diet a little bit and they eat morning glories here in Pinellas County. The giant swallowtail is so-called, it's as big as your hand. It's a big butterfly. And the swallowtail of the giant swallowtail um, is even differently colored than the rest of the hind wing. It's got these yellow uh, swallowtails. It's got the T-bar across the four wings, but really you can't miss this one in flight. It's a huge flyer. Its larval food plant is plants in the citrus family. And we don't have much native citrus, uh, but we do have this one, uh, the wild lime, uh, which has provided a food source. The citrus industry was certainly good for the giant swallowtails because suddenly all these Asian trees were coming in by the billions and being planted and the giant swallowtails were, wow, you know, look at all this larval food source. Check out the larva. That's, that's some foolery right there. That's some trickery. That's some mimicry. Mimicking bird dropping, avoiding being eaten. That's for sure. The spicebush swallowtail one of the dark or black swallowtails that I can't tell apart. Spicebush apparently has this beautiful iridescent blue, pale blue uh, spots on the hind wings. Uh, the sexes are different. So the male and female look slightly different. It seems like every single summer, I promise myself, I will figure out how to tell them all apart and I don't. I just like the dark swallowtails. I happen to 
know that the spice for swallowtail in this part of Florida, since there's no spice bush, feeds on the Red Bay. I've kept you too long. I'd love to keep going on and on and on. Um, there's other groups, the Buckeyes, um, the hair streaks, the wonderful hair streak butterflies. Uh, they have these fake pretend heads. They have these fake eyeballs. They even have fake antenna and they wiggle them when they're at rest so that if a bird comes to eat them, they're gonna eat the head first. And so they take a chomp of that fake head and yet the, the real head gets to live another day and fly away. The skippers are a large group of, of butterflies. They live up to their name. You can hardly observe them. Long tails, um, long tailed skipper, and of course the, the spread wing, the sooty wing skippers, but I really do need to let y'all go. Um, I would be more than happy to take uh, questions. I'll have a look at the q and A. It looks like we have about four questions in the Q&A in the chat. Has the chat blown up? Um, I think Julie is doing a fantastic job of answering questions in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to check the, the questions here. And we're um, going to launch a quick poll. And we're going to launch that. I forgot to. Before you go and before we get to questions, we have a poll. So I have the poll. I don't have the poll. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> quick, quick, answer these questions. And Julia can monitor how many of y'all are doing. Thanks so much, everyone. We've got a little over half of you. I'm going to leave the poll up for another 15 seconds, and we appreciate your feedback. All the thank yous. Well, we thank you, too, for joining us. And I'm going to get to a couple of questions we have in the Q&A. And one is more of an A than a Q. I heard the cicadas are going to be active this year. This might very well be a year where the the 17 year cicada emerges now they don't only live in one spot there the 17 year cicada is throughout the east coast um, but every 17 years wherever they exist they all emerge at once there are five there are species that are five year cicadas so that every five years you get a huge influx. Uh, generally speaking, in our part of Florida, we have annual cicadas. So generally speaking, we have the species that the same ones come up once a year, every year, and we can expect the same ones every year. That's not to say that here and there, there aren't places where we have some of the other species uh, that emerge in huge swarms. And the idea there is that they overwhelm their predators. So let's see what kind of a summer this is. It's possible to identify the different species of cicadas by their sounds. This summer, we, will, we promise we will bring you an entire class on the singing insects, the cicadas, the crickets, the katydids, all these wonderful things. We have a friend who is an expert on that um, wonderful and uh, on that wonderful subject. My background, there's a question about my background. Uh, I grew up here in Clearwater, turning over rocks and rocks, like there's any rocks, turning over logs, um, climbing trees, doing all that, going to the beach, going to the woods, all that fun stuff. Uh, but then I studied botany uh, when I went to university and got to work in botanic gardens. So I got to go all over the world. Once you're in the botanic gardens, you get to go all over the world. So I've lived all over the world, working with plants, working in botanic gardens. And every time you turn over a pile of soil, of course, you're going to encounter uh, all sorts of invertebrates. You can't study plants without studying inadvertently the insects. Um, did the monarch or the mimics come first? That's an excellent question. 
um, that might be one that we're gonna have to all do our homework. Um, the queen and the monarch, they have a they came from the same individual. There was a butterfly that a population of that butterfly split up. And one population over here became isolated and the population of the same species over here got, let me get closer, got isolated. And then they became two separate species. So they're more closely related to each other than they are to the viceroy, which came from a different ancestor. So that takes some homework. I, I, I don't even want to guess. Who's mimicking who? That's an excellent question. Why are butterflies called pollinators if they are not? Just because some are? Yes. Um, because butterflies go to flowers and take the nectar, um, there is a chance that they could transfer pollen. It's not what they're built to do. They don't have the structures on their body that transfer pollen, but that's not to say it doesn't happen. Um, if a butterfly happens to visit the same species over and over and over and over again, they're gonna move the pollen of that species perhaps to another flower. Uh, but butterflies tend to be a little bit less specific than that. So they might go from a petunia to a chrysanthemum to a tobacco plant. You see what I'm saying? Whereas our native bees, if they see a shape and color that they like, they're going to say petunia. I know what I'm going to get from petunia, 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 and so on. So it's not that butterflies can't. Um, they're just not very good at it. People are always talking about planting pollinator gardens because what they really want are butterflies. Let's just call it what it is. Call it a butterfly garden and attract butterflies. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you, want, if you want pollinators, remember, you're going to get wasps. They're excellent pollinators. You're going to get bumblebees. You're going to get uh, our native metallic bees. Um, mosquitoes are fantastic pollinators. Uh, some orchids actually depend on mosquitoes to be pollinators. So be careful when you talk about a pollinator garden, maybe, you know, just saying. Um, when do lubber nymphs appear? Yes, the lubber is that giant colorful grasshopper that I showed a slide of, uh, had the good example of the spiracles. Uh, that grasshopper, the lubber, they have, although the adults are solitary, they live solitary lives, their larvae, the nymphs, the young, that look very much like the adult because they don't have the complete metamorphosis, uh, they emerge right around now-ish, so soon. Uh, and they feed in packs and they can do quite a lot of damage. One hatching of, um, of lovers, one hatching of a, of a lover clutch uh, can move as a group and, and strip a lot of vegetation. Where insects become pests, you know, when they begin to encroach on something that we might rather be growing than sacrificing, uh, humans can take advantage of the fact that insects breathe through those spiracles, those holes in the abdomen. And all you need to do is clog those holes and you suffocate the insect. And you can clog the holes by spraying a, um, an oil or a soap onto the abdomen of the offending insect. If you can't bring it upon yourself to grab it and dispatch it, you can spray some oil or soap and there are oils and soaps that are specifically um, made, manufactured for the purpose of pest control. And they do not harm, they do not do great harm 
to any plants that they would get on. And they do not do any appreciable harm uh, to the applicator as long as the, the rules are followed. Roly polies have declined, don't see them, maybe not digging in the dirt quite as much. Um, roly polies. So these are the pill bugs. These are the little, or sow bugs. These are the little decomposers. They love to live in rotten wood. And if you can imagine, go back to when you're six years old and you're flipping over uh, the, 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 the debris and you see the roly poly and if you can get it to unroly and crawl in your hand, it's got more than six legs. It's got quite a few pairs of legs. Roly polies are actually not insects. They're crustaceans, they're crabs. <laughs> they have gills, but they're not aquatic. They keep a thin layer of water on their gills so that they can breathe on land. Has there been a decline in roly polies? I'm with you. I haven't tried to dig them, very, dig them up as much as I did when I was six. I think that's our homework. There's plenty of sunlight. Let's go find some roly polies. That's a great question. Was the love bug created by the University of Florida in order to control the mosquito population? Interesting question. Um, and it is not the first time that this question has come up. And as an informed citizen, I hope that you will take this information um, and share this information. Uh, the love bug is an invasive species. It is a natural species. It is native to Central and South America. The love bug we're talking about here. The love bug reproduces in cut grass. And starting around the 50s, maybe even as soon as the 40s, but the 50s certainly, the highway system was beginning to traverse more and more and more of the Southeast. As such, medians, and virgins were coming into existence. Long miles and miles and hundreds of miles of stretches of this cut grass, providing perfect habitat for the love bugs. And they moved along the highway system and swarmed where they lived because the conditions were just perfect and our cars were covered in love bugs. This happened in my lifetime, or at certainly my parents' lifetime here in Florida. So all of a sudden, it seemed there were these crazy bugs that got all over everything. And somehow a story came into being that these organisms were created to control mosquitoes. Um, that is not what happened. Love bugs came here on their own thanks to human activity. By our actions of creating highways, the love bugs found their way into our state and now they are resident. It is entirely possible, but I do not know for sure. It is entirely possible because it is known to have happened, research, on beneficial insects might have been going on as it is today, beneficial, beneficial insect research going on at the University of Florida, releasing a non-native insect to control another species, an invasive species. We have the air potato beetles that were reared and studied and studied and studied and studied and studied before they were released. So there might have been some biological research, biological control research going on around the time that the love bug showed up. Um, and maybe the love bug got, you know, cross-referenced with that. But long story short answer, no. Can I spray soapy water to get rid of insects around my house? Sure. It's the same idea. Um, if you visit, and I will maybe, uh, certainly you can contact your local extension office, get a recipe for the best ratio of dish soap to water to use as a contact 
pesticide, um, or if you don't want to use up your Dawn, or if you don't necessarily want to, you know, you can find formulations of horticultural oil, horticultural oil, or horticultural soap uh, that you can use as that um, control uh, mechanism around your house. Doesn't a butterfly garden attract other pollinators? Absolutely. Where there are flowers, there are pollinators. So there you go. Even though butterflies aren't great pollinators, make a pollinator garden, except the wasps, except the mosquitoes. I mean, you know, allow the wasp, allow and appreciate the mosquitoes and appreciate all the native uh, in addition to. In your love bugs are amazing pollinators of our native um, saw palmetto. Even though it's a non, it's a it's a non-native invasive species, it's an excellent pollinator. These flies, these love bugs. How do you get rid of lover grasshoppers? They're really easy just to grab and throw into some soapy water. That soapy water is going to cover them, break the surface tension, and they sink. I mean, they're really like I, I haven't tried. Um, it seems to me that it would be easy enough to, with a pair of gloves, grab a handful of baby lovers and throw them in some soapy water. Soap breaks the surface tension, soap clogs their little spiracles, curtains for the lovers. All right, y'all, we've gone about three quarters of an hour over, so we really need to wrap it up here. I hope you'll join us next week for Life of Lichen. We will go from insects, animals, to a group of organisms all working together. Fungus, bacteria, algae, yeast, all these things. Uh, next week, Life of Lichen. You can sign up by visiting um, brookercreekpreserve.org, which is maybe where you found this class today. Of course, it will be appearing on Facebook. And for today, uh, thank you very much for joining us and hopefully see you next week.